Hi, my name is Kevin. And I'm Rusty. Uh, we're, we may hopefully be familiar faces to you. Uh, we're with Springfield Leather Company. Uh, we're in the process of making a video. It's a designed, it's going to be designed to help you learn how to do some western floral carving. But as we've been thinking about it, we've decided to uh, include some leather education as well. You know, over the years, the leather world has changed a great deal. It's changed tremendously. And Springfield Leather has had to change with it, wouldn't you say? Well, we have been definitely changing. We're changing about as fast as we can to keep up with the needs of the different customers. It seems like anymore we answer somewhere between, as of this time, we, we answer anywhere from 20 to 40 emails a day. And, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And what did I use for this? And what, what product should I use to accomplish this? So as we go along here, hopefully you'll see some tips and hints. And in the near future, you'll see a video that's uh, dedicated to answering some of those more common problems. Uh, Springfield Leathers had to adapt. Uh, one of the things that you might have noticed in the adaptation that we've done is to sell leather by the piece. As of this moment, I don't know of anybody that sells leather by the piece, do you? Not that I can think of, no. Uh, we'll cut a double shoulder for you. Uh, we'll sell you a foot of, of embossed python print or things like that. We hope that helps. <coughs> well, you know, too, the reason that we're doing a lot of this in, in addition to the fact that we're changing and the leather world itself is changing so much, as you know, Kevin, uh, a lot of that information's just gone away with the old guys who used to do it forever. You know, it went away and, and they would teach somebody maybe and maybe they'd do it for a little bit and then they give up and it's just, it's a disappearing thing. But yet it's not a dead art. Many, many people want to know how to do it. We get those 30 and 40 questions all the time. How do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, a lot of those old books and the patterns and stuff, they're in print. They're, they're just lost, not up to date. Lost in a, a library if, if they're even in existence at all. So we've even talked a little bit about doing an R&D department, which we've developed. And through that R&D department, it's helping us to put together patterns for you. It's helping us to put together new ideas. It's helping us to put to, uh, this kind of thing in place where the need is. You know, uh, uh, there's people who can do some of this. Uh, but at the same time, those tricks and tips that we try and drop through the catalog or in those videos, that's really, I think, what will benefit people the most. Yeah, I think you're right. And, you know, for whatever it's worth to people that are watching this right now, I know you have made a pair of shoes, uh, and that's no small feat. Uh, you've made a great, a tremendous number of, of products out of leather, uh, as I have. Uh, I've for whatever it's worth for people that want to do figure carving I can't think of anything I probably haven't carved into a piece of leather over the last 40 years but regardless of all that uh, between yourself myself Ben in our shop Springfield leather has accumulated a tremendous amount of practical leather craft experience that we want to share uh, with anybody that would like to see it we're going to charge for some of it but most of it uh, probably is end up going to be in free be being free you know through the internet or what have you every every person's different too and every person having a little bit of a different angle uh, will mean that you see different faces doing different videos a lot of times and the the idea behind that is because the better you understand something the better you can explain it uh, and so our goal is is to do just that to explain it to the best of our ability so that when you watch it uh, it changes the questions that you ask. We're still encouraging the emails and the questions and the phone calls that we get, but hopefully we're able to answer some of them this way, and then the question that you ask us now allows you to end up with an even better product uh, or end result than what you would have if you didn't get those answers up front. So That sounds good. So we should get to it. shade and bevel, paint it and you seat it, and your background like the devil. That's probably the dumbest song you have ever heard in your whole entire life and I feel pretty stupid singing it. But 
That's kind of how basic floral carving works. You cut it, cam, shade, and bevel, vein it, seat it, and background like the devil. Kind of helps you keep the basic order of the tools in mind. It's not that you have to do it that way, but it's kind of helpful. So now, we'll get into it. Well, after that thrilling musical interlude, I'm sure you're just more than eager to see how we go about this. The purpose of Leathercraft Volume 2 is to uh, help people to be able to get started perhaps with Western floral carving and give some education along the way. Rusty and I here are going to get through this and we're going to give you some tips and hints and show you some little how-to's and some things that are really important and some things that aren't. Uh, as I said, the first thing we're going to do is some Western floral carving. There's a couple of things that are more important than anything else and you absolutely have to take note of these. There's not a whole lot of things you have to remember here, but there's a couple things that you do. Three, really. The first one is the moisture content of your leather has to be right. You'll soon enough discover that when it's wrong, things don't work. The second thing is, when you do leather work, when you're tooling it, you need to work on a piece of marble or granite or polished stone or glass. Not metal, that doesn't work. If you want to pound on an old board or a table, you'll soon learn that that doesn't work either. The last thing that you need to know is you need to keep your swivel knife sharp. It has to be polished. Okay, we're going to get into it. First of all, we're going to do a wallet. I've got a happy little pattern here that I traced a while ago. And we're going to put that pattern on this leather. Now, the first thing that I did on this piece of leather was put masking tape on the back of it. The reason I did that is because we're going to do a whole bunch of pounding on the top of this and it'll dish that leather out. So when you put masking tape on the back of it, it stops that from spreading. Okay. It's really important too when you're doing, like you said, a lot. You know, you do a basket weave or something, that thing oh, will goodness. stretch out. Just as big as could be. Yeah, you can make dinner plate out of it, which it's okay if you got chihuahuas or something, but okay, now we're gonna get the leather wet. I've got a professional plastic can of water here. A semi professional sponge. And hopefully you can tell that I'm putting a fair amount of water on here. Now a lot of people take that sponge, they squeeze all the water out. And then they get it on the leather and it's hardly, you can see this, this had quite a bit of water there and it takes a minute for it to soak in. This is the one thing that takes a little bit of experience and there's no way around that. You'll get that experience really fast because when your leather is too wet, it does not work. When it's too dry, it does not work and you'll be able to tell immediately when it's too wet. Just for instruction purposes, I am going to take this piece of leather and put about half of it down in the water. It's really wet. It's really wet. You know, when it's too wet, it just doesn't work. Don't run your leather under the faucet. Don't dip it in the sink. You don't need to do that. This gets so wet, next thing you know, there's no way you can stop it from stretching. It's ishy. It doesn't work. On the other hand, you can see the other half of this piece of leather here is starting to dry out pretty nicely. And that's that's when it's ready to start working. Okay. So this end is ishy? You, uh, mushy, ishy, ishy. dampish. We're it's, right in the, it's not happy. We're right in the dictionary. Yeah, keep track of these terms. There'll be a test. Okay, now we're going to transfer the pattern. Now, I got a little water on my rock. If you're using a paper pattern, you really don't want to get water on it because it just makes that pattern non-usable in a hurry. This part of the leather's got the right amount of water in it. I've got a little stylus here. It's got a little ball point on the end. And all I'm going to do is lay that flower on here. What I'm going to do is trace this happy little flower onto the leather. Where'd you get your pattern from? I drew it. You know, cheated. You take and find a picture on the internet, tape a piece of tracing film right to the screen, trace it right on there, put that on the, any picture you want. 
He's not as dumb as folks say. That's every not a bad idea. A every once in a while. Okay, you can see, leaves a pattern on your leather. Now, we're gonna set this piece aside. I've already put my pattern on this piece. This is the piece that has the tape on it. The next thing we do uh, is we're gonna cut that, that pattern. And there's all kinds of tools, there's all kinds of swivel knives. Some people feel that they have to use a $9 million swivel knife to make this work, and that's okay. If you can afford it, more power to you. Mine's cheap, it's got a cheap little blade on it. Here's the key. The key is this little scrap piece of leather, and it has jeweler's rouge rubbed into it. If you don't have this, you're not gonna be happy. You can buy enough jeweler's rouge for a couple of bucks to last you your lifetime. Just do this. Drag it back over it, wipe the gunk off it, and you're ready to go. You know, the only thing I've ever had any issue with that was is you really got to make sure that you don't, don't flip the end of that thing because you'll buff the edge right off of it. That is a fact. You can round that edge over really fast. Now, it's, there's one instance that that's okay, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Now, we're going to hold this swivel knife like this. Not like that. Keep your finger right there so that you can turn this. We're going to tip it forward. Pull a tortoise. Now, I want to show you something here in just a second about this pattern that I traced on the leather. common problem with people who start doing leather work is they think everything has to be perfect. Well, I got news for you. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. And you're not ever going to make it perfect. Now, if you were close up, you could probably see, maybe you can anyway, some areas where I didn't exactly hit the lines too perfectly. There's a number of places where they're just not perfectly straight. Well, don't worry about that. Those things are going to get corrected as you go. You can kind of correct them with the swivel knife as you're going. Otherwise, the tools are going to correct those things for you. Okay, now, when you use the swivel knife, it's important that it slide through the leather. And you can probably get an idea that my knife is relatively sliding through the leather. And if you don't cut the lines perfectly, don't worry about it. It just is not that critical. Now, if you're a perfectionist or one of those people where everything has to be just so, then just take what I'm saying into consideration because uh, it's pretty challenging to, to get this perfect. There's another thing that comes into play. And that is, has to do with the type of leather that you're actually carving on. Got any ideas, Rusty? Well, I know that this is a piece of Herman Oak. That's very true. I also know that uh, the firmer the grain is in the leather, the better the tool ability is. Uh, Herman Oak is probably one of the most toolable leathers available. That is true as well. And just so that you understand the principle behind what Rusty said, it's kind of like, well, if you can imagine it, learning to play guitar on a really lousy guitar. It just doesn't work. It makes your fingers hurt doesn't sound good, it's hard on you, nothing's very happy about it. By the way, don't be afraid to turn your leather as you're working with this. And another thing, when you're making these cuts, the cuts should all come down to a point, to the same direction in your pattern. If you notice, on this flower, all the lines actually go towards the center of the flower. On the rest of this design, everything flows down, sort of towards a triangular point. If you do it other in a different way, it's not going to look right. So anyway, back to this leather. 
I like working on a piece of Herman Oak leather. It cuts nice. It actually the, the knife just slides through it if it's sharp. And speaking of sharp, when your knife starts to drag and pull, you're going to need to stop, strop it a few times, wipe the stuff off, and then you can go back to cutting. It's interesting, you know, the only thing you're doing when you do that is just taking the lines where it's been ground and you're just smoothing them out, giving it an edge back, and it makes a world of difference. Yeah, it's really more of a polish than anything. And that's what it, it needs to be. It needs to be polished so that this blade will slide through the leather. It's slick. If you t think you're going to make this sharp by putting it on a grindstone or a whetstone, well, it's true, you can make it sharp, but you don't make it slick that way. So this Jeweler's Rouge polishes it. That makes it slide through the leather. Now, we're talking about Herman Oak leather being nice to carve. The reason that's the case is because Herman Oak just flat figured out how to do it over a hundred years ago. There's a ton of other leathers out there on the market that you can buy and you can do this with. The problem is most of those leathers were not designed, they were not manufactured for this purpose. Herman Oak leather is manufactured in part for this purpose. That's why it works so well. The imported leathers that come from overseas, many of them are just fine. They were not manufactured for this purpose. They were manufactured so somebody could make belts or whatever, but not necessarily hand tool them. Okay. Now hopefully you watch and were able to see how I use that knife. If you keep that up, you could get a job doing that. I had a job doing this once. I don't know. I guess it worked out. <laughs> Okay, remember I told you, Rusty mentioned about how you don't want to do this with your knife because it rolls the edge. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing to have a knife with a rolled edge that's dull because there's times when you want to, you want to carve on a thin piece of leather. Well, if you take a sharp knife and you start cutting on a thin piece of leather, you're going to cut too far into it. You bend it and it cracks and it splits. That's not happy. So you cut with a dull knife. Well, actually, I don't know how well you can see this. We'll see here in a minute. Those lines that I just put on that piece of leather are not cut. They're just denting the leather. We're pushing the blade into the leather, but it's not cutting it. You still have a pattern to follow, and you can still bevel those lines, but great for working on a thin piece of leather that you don't want to cut all the way through. Okay, that's tip number one or two or whatever we've done here. Now, our musical little interlude, remember? Let's see. Cut. We did that. Camouflage tool. Now, talking about the tools for a second. There's six in a basic set. I have an extra one because I like it. It's a mule's foot. You can use it or not, doesn't matter. First tool we're going to use is a camouflage tool. Very easy to use. Many times, when you use these tools, you only use part of it. Sometimes you'll stand them straight up and down, but sometimes you just need one corner or the other, and that's, that's okay. I'm going to tip it up. Okay, then we're going to do something in the, uh, oh, let's see. Where else do I want to put this? You know what? You can use this tool anywhere you want, and I think I'll just use it right here a couple of times. nice as a border too. Yes it does and you might ask how in the world do you know where to use each one of these tools? Well if you're doing this from a pattern 
the pattern will show you where to use each one. Since I'm kind of doing this on my own, and I want to make the point that there aren't any rules written in stone where to use these tools. You can use it wherever you wish to. I use it inside the flower, and I'm going to kind of cover that up here in a minute, but I just wanted you to see that. We'll use it along the flower stem. That's the camouflage tool. Next comes the pear shader, shaped like a pear, called a pear shader. It's actually pretty easy to use, but this tool right here, the principle that's involved in using it is going to cover a lot of ground for you. You need to learn to walk a tool. And by that, I mean you have to hold it tight enough to where when you hit it, it actually goes down into the leather and comes back up. There's no way you could prevent that from happening. So I'm going to scoot up here. I'm going to hold this tool just like this, not like that, not like that. Don't grab it with your fist, it's not happy. Hold your, your tool with two or three fingers, whatever you're comfortable with, at an angle to the tool. Then you've got to use your hand as a base and maybe a couple fingers. Think of your hand as being a vise. Tightening it down in a vise. Pull the vise. You can pull vise. That's all you can do. That's the only way you can move it. So I'm going to hold it barely touching the leather. And I'm going to start tapping. And I'm going to pull it. Then I'm going to tap it on this happy little wet spot. Isn't that lovely? That's what happens when your leather is too wet. It doesn't work. If you work on leather that is too dry, here's a dry piece. That's just about as lovely. I can't see it. It doesn't work. Your leather has to have the right amount of moisture in it. That's it. That's just the biggest, most important thing that I'll probably tell you on this video. Okay, now, we're going to... Oh, one other thing I wanted to show you. If you think that you're going to use this tool and hold it down like this, and then hit it and move it, it's not a happening thing. You have to learn to hold the tool up just a little with your fingers like you can see I'm doing. And then, you notice how my whole wrist, my whole arm is moving. When you want to move some more, pick it up. Move almost your whole hand and arm every time you want to move that. Now, here we go. We're going to There's a lot of different kinds of uh, stamping tools. Basically, the difference in most of the Western floral tools is that they're either smooth or they're checkered. What you use is kind of up to you. Personally, I like the checkered ones, but that's just me. Now, do you remember when we started smashing this flower around and on the piece of leather that's too wet, it bent up, folded it up, and this one even started to do it. This one isn't doing that because we've got the masking tape on the bottom. Now, again, your pattern, if you have one, will show you where to use each one of these tools. And if you feel like being creative, 
more power to you. Because again, there's no real right or wrong here. That's the nice thing about leather work in general. As long as you like it and it turned out, you're happy with it and it does what you wanted it to do. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's that's just really true, Rusty. And, and I have yet to see anybody that picked up one of my wallets, even when I was not a very good carver at all. I just don't ever remember somebody picking one up and saying, oh my gosh, you used the pear shader in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. Actually, the pear shader that I'm using now is really pretty pretty easy to use. And we're about done. And probably at some point you've asked, well, how does he know when he's got the right amount of water in the leather? Well, this is how you know. You see all the nice brown shaded areas there? Well, that's because of this rock, and it's because of having the right amount of water in the leather. Now, it's true, you may have to wet that piece of leather again, but you want to remember, there's already water in it. There's just not enough. If it dries out, remember, there's already water in it, there's just not enough. So when you add more, be careful, because you may have to wait for a while for things to get ready to tool again. Now, pear shader. The next one, this is the one that's the real pain in the butt for people. This is called a beveler. It's a checkered one. It's got one straight up and down vertical face, tools a little slanted, it's a happy little guy. A beveler is used two reasons. Number one, it makes your pattern looks like it's raised up. In other words, it gives you depth. The other reason is to place one part of your design behind another. But don't forget that. Your beveler pushes leather down and it's used to place one part of your design behind the other. I'm going to show you right off. These, these two leaves, this, these two leaves of the flower should be in front of part of this little leaf and they should be in front of the stem and they should be in front of this little part of the scroll. So I'm going to bevel this just like this. And keep in mind this tool works just like the pear shader. You need to learn to walk it. If you don't learn to walk the tool, it's going to take you a long, long time to get done. I'll bevel just this little line here. Now hopefully you can see that by pushing this leaf down, this petal appears to be on top. By pushing the stem down, this petal appears to be on top. By pushing that leaf down, this petal appears to be on top. That's just how it works. So you bevel around your design and uh, this is the part that will take you longer than any other part of the, the carving. You can, if you wish, just sit there and do this. But if you do, lots of times you get funny little choppy marks, and plus it just takes you forever. So my advice is to learn to go fast, but not too fast. Now again, as we mentioned earlier, people do leather work for two reasons. One is fun, the other one's money. If you're doing leather work for money, 
and you're doing this stuff right here that involves a lot of hand beveling, you may want to rethink your life or your <laughs> beveling method because this can just flat take a while. So there's a couple options. One, you can get a bigger beveler and they make wider ones and that's happy, that works. But still, it's a lot of tap, 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 tap and, and that can, you know, that can hinder the amount of money that you would actually term as profit because of the tremendous amount of time involved. Now, on this particular project, most people, if they were using this same beveler, uh, it would probably take them an hour to do the bevel. Well, I'm going to do it and oh, probably maybe seven or eight minutes and you might not even see me do it all. But one other thing that I wanted to show you was another type of beveler. This is a plastic bevel blade. We're going to put this little bevel blade in this swivel knife, tighten it down a little bit, and I'm going to run it down this long edge of the wallet. And if you work it back and forth, you can still get a pretty good burnish. Now it'll never be the same burnish as what you get when you hit the tool. But it'll be pretty good. And if you were hitting this, I'll guarantee it would take you a lot longer to do what I just did. There. So now we got the whole outside beveled with the happy little bevel blade. That's it's a couple of bucks. I mean, that's worth the money. Now we're going to finish up. And you can probably tell as I'm going along that uh, the leather's drying out just a little bit. That's okay. It's just fine. And you remember when I told you about uh, transferring your pattern? How it didn't have to be perfect? Well, if you're you were able to be right up in my position, you could see that this beveler is getting rid of what looked to be some irregularities in the tracing. Because it's pushing the leather down, that texture covers them up. Works really nice. And close only got a couple of little more spots to go and don't expect to go this fast it's not gonna happen right away if I had a dollar for every one of these wallet backs that I've tooled I think I could buy an island on the Finley River wouldn't be much of an island but still This little circle here that I've left open, I'm going to do this a little strangely. I'm going to push the leather inside the circle on part of it, and I'm going to push the leather down around the circle on the other part. And yes, you can do that because I just want to. Then you look over your pattern. See if you missed any lines. 
Hopefully not. If you miss some, go back and get them. Still, you can probably see if you look closely, some parts of the leather have a little more dampness than others. Other parts look dry. Well, it's fine. It's when the leather stops taking that brown burnish that you need to change the moisture content. The rest of this is just easy. I'm going to use a tool called a veiner and I am going to use it well you'll see and I'm only using part of it I'm gonna turn it and I'm gonna use just the end right where the flower petals kinda come together this is a pretty happy little effect Sometimes people don't realize too when your moisture content's right, you're using the right leather, you don't need to schmuck those tools. That's right. They'll take the well, See where we pressure. tap that right where the flower petals come together? Kind of gives your, your cuts a finished look. It stops things in a, a nice fashion. I think I like that so much I'm just gonna use that in several other places. But you gotta tip it up. Tip it where the cuts come to an end. And let's see. Matter of fact, I think I like this well enough to where I'll just use it there. And oh, maybe I'll just go around this little thing with it. Oh, let's see. Maybe we could do this yeah, right here too. may be a little difficult to see, but we used it right here, and we used it along this little leaf. We used it here, we used it inside the flower. Next comes the cedar. Cedar's a little round guy. We're going to put the center in this flower. You wanted to. You can go ahead and fill that flower center in with these happy little seeds and more power to you. I have a tendency to be on the lazy side. You can ask my wife, ask him, he'll tell you. So I'm going to take a swivel knife and I'm just going to make some little cuts right across it and then we'll make a little crosshatch pattern. That's good enough. There's a lot of different ways to make flower centers. We'll show you some later. And after that, I am going to take my backgrounder and I'm going to background. Again, this is a tool that you want to learn to walk if you can. this tool, it might be a little helpful if you learn to turn it as you use it. This is a very, very small background. Usually the first thing that somebody says if they're, if they're new to doing this is, my gosh, don't you have a bigger one? Well, yeah, we do. There's a lot of different types of backgrounders and there's a lot of different patterns to backgrounders and you can do some really cool stuff but you might as well learn this one first if you do you'll be happy this is a this would be called a traditional backgrounder if you've ever seen a piece of western floral carving there's a good chance it used one of these. And by the way, all this working on this leather, don't be afraid to turn your leather. Because as soon as you start trying to move your hand and everything else so that it's not natural feeling, that's when you start making mistakes. Don't be afraid to turn the leather 
however you need to turn it to do what you want to do. Now you'll notice, I think, well you will, when you look at this, that the backgrounded areas really have a nice dark definition. And we're gonna, that's because the moisture content is right. So we've been able to keep working all this time with just that initial moisture content that we, we did. You'll also notice that the leather isn't stretching out into a, a doggy dish. And that's because of that tape. These little details like that really make it pop too. Oh man, this makes it look really cool. There's a lot of other things you can do. We're not going to get into all of those right now. There's tools like an undercut beveler, which makes those leaves you cut underneath them and you can push them up. Uh, there, there's just so many different things. And you'll learn soon enough what you like and what you don't. comes to these tools I would suggest do what you like don't do what you don't but it would be nice if you learn to walk the tools because that's pretty darn helpful I don't know if you can imagine using this tool one at a time just bonk bonk my stars You'd be here for days. We've just got a couple more areas to do. A little background too to let you get into all those tight spots like that. Yes, it does. And it does have a point on it. So you can really get right in the corners. left I think. <laughs> and by the way most of the time if you do a if you were to do this this wallet It would be almost, it would be extremely difficult for you to do this without having to wet the leather again. It would just be extremely difficult. But you'll appreciate when you go and try and do this that it just takes longer than perhaps what I make it seem like it takes. That's the background. That looks really nice, doesn't it? Okay, now comes the fun part something called decorative cuts. Decorative cuts are what just kill it for most people. The reason is most of the time their knife isn't sharp enough. The other thing is practice. So again, if you have a pattern, it'll show you how to make these decorative cuts and where to make them. But you know, you're not under any written rules to make those decorative cuts like somebody tells you to. The best thing I can tell you is keep them simple and short. Keep them deeper when you start, shallow when you finish.
have a tendency to follow the curvature of the pattern and always make sure that your cuts come down to a point that all of them agree and that takes some practice when you learn to make nice decorative cuts you'll be happy and you can see that my motions with my hand I'm keeping the blade straight up and down unless of course it's parallel to me but for the most part the cuts are very short always pulling them toward me nice sweeping curves and I've got a knife that glides through this leather really easily and the reason it glides through the leather easily is two two reasons number one it's sharp number two <coughs> this is Herman Oak leather I guarantee you some of these import leathers around and I've got plenty of them here they cost more money and they don't carve nearly as well so if you have questions for heaven's sakes call us just uh, email us call us ask us questions we'll help you it's our, in our interest to make sure you uh, are successful okay now we've got there's our decorative cuts I'm gonna do one last thing to it well maybe two you remember I told you I liked an extra tool in the basic set the mules foot Well, I'm gonna use that let's see Mule's foot's very easy to use. And it really adds a lot to your work. At least I think it does. And most of the time it would be used right underneath where we tapped the veiner. where the leaves come together sometimes you hit it once sometimes you hit it two or three times and you can probably see where we used it right here here and some other places you want to get carried away a little bit you can take a pointy little tool right underneath the bottom place that you hit you can just make a couple of little indentations maybe three or four dents in the leather is all it is And what it does is it just gives your your pattern more of a flow. This is a pretty good example right here. We had the mule's foot hit three times and we put a couple of little dots under it. Same thing here. Here. And we're done. All you do is take the tape off, do your staining and dyeing, and that's it. All right, now that we've gotten this far, I've hammered out a little Western floral design on this piece of leather, kind of quickly. It's not perfect, but it'll work for what we want to do. And you can see it's similar to the other design. The steps that were taken were all the same, but we're gonna do some, we're gonna show you some little tips, maybe a few little tricks that'll help you to make your work look unique. And we're gonna apply the KISS principle, which I'm sure you know, but it's K-I-S-S, if you don't know, it's called Keep It Simple Stupid, or Keep It Simple Silly, or if your name's Sam, Keep It Simple Sam. We're going to do that. Now, first of all, 
I've got a tool called a pro pedal. It's just a little shaft and a wooden handle and hopefully it's kind of sharp. What this does is it lifts up the petals of a flower. So all I'm going to do is take it off and I'm going to lay it flat on the leather. I'm going to start just very, very slowly working it right under this part of the particular area that I want to raise up. What this does, it actually cuts into the side of the leather that you beveled and you can work it and hopefully you can see as you work it in there it just lifts that up quite drastically actually. You can push and worm and wiggle your way in there and then we're going to come over here and do the other side and we're only going to do a little bit of this because this is something that that takes a little time you have to be kind of careful if you're not too careful you can cut right through the bottom of your leather and while that's not really serious if you cut through the top of your leather that is kind of serious that's not good so when your leather has the right amount of wash of moisture in it your leather will hold that shape and you can see hopefully you can see how the this part of your your flower has the petals that stick up and if you go all the way around this and do other areas that you like it really makes a pretty significant difference I'll do one more just so that you can see we're going to do an area right here this is a fairly wide area so you can see that I'm kind of moving this tool sideways using the point of it to cut and at the same time forcing it into the side of the leather and again you have to be careful now if you need to you can stop and use that little uh, swivel knife sharpener to polish it I'll show you which I don't have one so I have to make one This one was pretty dull, which would explain why it was giving me a hard time. Hopefully it's sharper now. Okay, we're back to pushing it under the leather, lifting up a part of the design that we want to lift up. Now you're going to find that as you do this, you create a fairly unpleasant area on the outside. So we're going to address that. This is an example of a pro pedal used to the extreme. So that little thing that I did on the flower on the wall at back is one thing, but this kind of shows you what really can be done with a pro pedal. Some of these oak leaves, you can you can stick something in there, my gosh, three quarters of an inch. So that gives you an idea of what you can do with a pro pedal if you really want to. So now we've got one raised area, two, and three, and that's kind of nice. There's other areas we could raise. Any place with an inward curve you can do. Now, you probably can see that this area has been backgrounded with that little backgrounder that we used on the first design. There's all kinds of backgrounding tools that do lots of neat patterns. We have one here that I like in particular, if I can find it. Technically it's called a matting tool numbers 885 if it helps you but instead of using it in the center I'm going to use it around the outside of the design and I'm going to walk it Don't have to worry. 
worry about being perfect with this tool at all because you can't be. One of the nice things about it is that almost nobody uses this tool. And it really gives you an interesting effect. And you can also see that it's starting to cover up that little area where we use the, uh, the pro pedal. I'm going to go all the way around this. Fortunately, our leather still got enough water in it. And as we come to areas that are that have a curve, just overlap the tool enough make it look okay, you'll see immediately what looks okay and what doesn't. And all I'm going to do is just complete the outer perimeter here. I kind of hit it a little harder where I used that pro pedal. sort of helps to mitigate that little mark that we left there. And keep in mind that if, if I was going to use that pro pedal, I might not have used this tool to do this uh, backgrounding. I might have chosen another. But that's okay. Whoops. Missed some places. Okay. Nice little different border that we've given the pattern. Now here's where the fun stuff comes in, or at least I think it's fun. If you wish, when you're using a swivel knife to make decorative cuts, you don't have to keep all those cuts on the inside of the pattern. You notice that we've left a pretty distinct border all the way around the design. Well, we're going to enhance that with the swivel knife. All we're going to do is go all the way around the edge, just kind of, sort of, sticking to that little border that we just created with that, that matting tool or backgrounding tool. You don't have to be perfect, but this is an easy way to achieve a really unique effect, again, that's rarely seen when people do western floral carving. Occasionally you might run into it, but it's not that common. And again, make sure your knife is sharp, and mine is, because if it's not, things just don't work all that well. Sometimes I'm, I'm really close to the edge of this area that I've created with the matting tool. Sometimes I'm a little farther away. It's not critical. Now we've got an outline. Once you've got your outline, you can do some swivel cuts that are really, that really make this look nice. The trick about the swivel cuts is to apply that kiss principle. The keep it simple thing really applies here. Short, sweeping, and it really doesn't matter where you put them as long as they're short. And as soon as you start trying to get complicated and make long cuts, life gets difficult. So try not to do that. When you make these cuts, as you end them, the cut should come in towards the pattern. Always. It's amazing what all these little details and little things can do to the simple pattern. You know, it doesn't take much. And that kind of goes along with the, the keep it simple thing. 
and you would be amazed at how far you can go if you want to with this little knife in creating just all kinds of little enhancements and uh, I, I guess that's the best way to say it it just looks like you're a lot better carver than what you are now see all those little cuts around there they really help they help a lot I'll show you how you learn to do them here's what you do you take your swivel knife and you make a long straight cut in a good piece of leather just like that all you do then is make cuts on one side of that line and every single cut has to come in towards that line when you end it. You push hard when you start, you ease up when you stop, just like this. I'm going to make three. Now see, that's something you can do. Now I'm going to make a wrong one, okay? Here's the wrong one. It's up at the top. Right there. You see how the end of the cut goes away from the line where all the others came in towards it? That's the problem. You can fix that if you have room. Here's how you fix it. We put a little tail right at the end that brings it back towards that center line. Now, watch what happens when I add to these other cuts. This is a practice exercise for you. Made little bitty cuts. They don't really come in towards the line, but now Now they do, and it flows. You can go on and on and on with this type of practice. And it's good for you to do this. I'm gonna make just some miscellaneous cuts here just so you can get an idea. They're all very small, very short, and they're all very similar. If you want to do other things, you can. Now, obviously, I've been working on just one side of that line. You need to practice on the other side, too. Do it the same way. There's no substitute for practice on making decorative cuts. Keep your swivel knife sharp. That's, that's critical. Decorative cuts are the thing that give most people the most problems. Back to that matting tool. I'm going to fill in. Normally on a western floral pattern you might have an area for an initial or something. Well this isn't for an initial but I wanted to leave a blank space to show you what you can do. This little matting tool can fade out. I'm turning it and twisting it as I use it. And I'm also changing the pressure with which I hit the tool. Now we've got an area that's just matted and has a nice background. In addition to that, if you wish, you can use your swivel knife. You can cut right into that matted area. So we'll just do that a little bit here. And Again, you'll see how it just adds to the flow. Right there. We just made some nice little cuts. It's an area that's matted. You could map this whole area out here if you want. And it looks pretty good. Again, there's no rules, so you can do what you want. Now, happy swivel cutting. Next, I want to tell you about the modeling tool. A modeling tool is necessary. You have to have one. And many people will tell you that after you, you do your floral carving, you use a modeling tool, either one end or the other, to smooth out your work. 
Well, yes, you can do that. But there's a very important point that you want to be aware of. Number one, when you touch a piece of vegetable tanned leather that's wet with a modeling tool, you have forever altered its surface. I'll give you an example. Rusty, you want to hand me that horsey? Okay. Here we have a happy little happy little horse that I had carved into this piece of leather many, many years ago. And a modeling tool was used extensively. It was used to push up the leather from the back. It was used to shape the contours, the muscle marks, all those things. When you do that, it helps tremendously, but it also changes the surface of the leather. An example, would, could you hold this for a second, Rusty? An example would be this that I'm going to show you. Watch. Hopefully you can see that line on that piece of leather. Now if you put antique stain or dye or whatever over that piece of leather, the place where I marked it is going to be different than the rest of the leather without fail. There's no way you can alter that. So you have a choice. You're either okay with that or you need to make the rest of the leather look like that surface. So you can use your modeling tool, do a little rubbing. You can work it, rub harder in some areas than others. You can give it whatever contour you want to, to do on this, going back to this, this horse. All of those contoured areas but the rest of the horse had to be gone over with the modeling tool that way the dyes work uniformly and they look good when you're done now there's several kinds of dyes you got spirit dye which is what's been done to use the to create the shading on the horse and you got paint and there's a, that white stands out rather significantly as paint this grass was kind of a translucent green. Well, it's not anymore because it's faded away. Now I want to show you another. This is my happy little fish. It's a crappie. Not that it matters. Again, modeling tool used. The fish was pushed out from the back with this tool while the leather was wet. Pushed and worked and scraped. Then I took this little tool and sharpened up an edge and polished it on my little strop and I used that to actually cut away the surface of the leather so that I had fins that stick up and a gill that sticks out. That's what you can do with a modeling tool. Now this coloring is paint. Rusty, what would you say the main difference is between paint and dye? Well, for one thing, your paint's going to lay on the outside edge. It's also going to give you the ability to shade and to fade into a different color quite a bit easier than a dye would because a dye is absorbed into the leather pretty rapidly and usually fairly deep. Uh, also, you'll end up, uh, an acrylic paint will leave that shiny look on top of it once it's done. It's easy to cut down with water and, and make your own colors up as you go. Yep, so uh, one thing to keep in mind, there's no rules. You can do whatever you want. An advantage of paint is if you get something the wrong color, you can paint over it with the right color. With dye, it's a little harder to do. It's done. But you'll never know until you try. Something that this really adds, though, Kevin, is, is the dimensions that are added to the little bit of extra that you did, even with the pro pedal on those flowers. Once you see that, you may not see it looking flat on, but once it's turned and you're able to see the shadowing behind it, just like on these fins, it just changes the picture. Completely. It really does. And on a billfold, doing a pro pedal on a billfold isn't very practical. You're going to stick the dumb thing in your pocket and sit on it while you're roofing in 95 degree weather or, or your Uncle Ralph will do that. So pro pedaling, lifting up the pedals on a wallet isn't too practical. But doing it on a wall carving, a picture, uh, you know, a briefcase, something like that, a book cover, looks really cool. So there's tip number four slash B6WX. Lastly, regarding the swivel knife and your decorative cuts, 
here's the best practice exercise for you. Start with your knife blade parallel in front of you. Dig it in, turn it, pull it towards you, and lift it up. You sweep with it. You're going to do another one right over here. Sweep with it. Then we're going to do one from the other direction. Dig it in, turn it, sweep with it. That's it. Learn to do that. You know, practice. If you need scrap leather, call me. I'll see that you get some. We have a little bit here, don't we? Yeah, just a couple. Then learn to do the rest of it. I know this is a little fast, and that's okay. But you'll notice every single cut is short. Get yourself a decent swivel knife with a decent blade, polish it up, and then practice. Hopefully this has been worth your while. Thanks.